It's very healthy. All right, so let's go and get started. First thing is first. So I ended up telling stories first period, and so we didn't get as far as I want. And so since I am here today and I was worried about being gone, uh, we're gonna do the test on Thursday. Next, we might or might not get to the stories. Where do we finish it here? Do we get to the NRA? Oh, and we got the Farah. We didn't get the NRA. All right, so let's go and get started. We're going to have to go fairly fast, but let's watch. There's going to be about, there's going to be about 12 matching, and then like five multiple choice, and then one short answer question right now, and that's a, uh, uh, the cause of the Great Depression. Remember, and so that'll be an A, B, and C. So A will be one. I gave you seven causes. A, B, and C. You pick one. Yeah. Are they matching on all of these programs? So the matching, I, I gave you that list, all the list of programs. Yes. The matching will only be the ones that are on that review list. Okay. So not on all. <laughs> only on the review list I gave you. And then I have the review list, and I did post it online. Oh, let. Shh, let me know if Teams is not working. Teams is not working for, and so please let me know. Yeah. So I'm going to try to decide how I want to do the diagram. I want to do trickle down and Keynesian, and I might have a, I might do it like Monday, and we just do like a 15 minute Keynesian versus trickle down. And so like a mini test just on Monday, just have it on that day. So I want to make I, I want to make this one a little bit smaller. Is there only going to be one choice or no choice? Yeah, that's my plan. Yeah, so it should take you about half an hour. That's my plan. All right. So uh, we got right to here, correct? So let's get to we got the far, we got fireside chats. We're right in the middle of fair. Is that right? Or do we finish fair? Uh, oh, we got the Eleanor Roosevelt. Good. Hopkins is most of all the way. 
So it would set all businesses would join it, all corporations, and the NRA, they would for all corporations would set production, price, and wage limits for everybody. With the idea of being organized in the economy like the War Productions Board, which was started in World War I. So Roosevelt had this plan, okay, we'll do central planning and we can alleviate the problems of overproduction right here and take a little bit of like interlocking directorates and all that. And so they really tried to sell it. And so you would do it by putting this little sign up right here saying you're part of it, the NRA. We are in this together. And they created this massive, Cumbersome board to figure this out. Please what? And so it'll offer you. No, just wait. And so the NRA started out with a boom and turned into a disaster. It became too big, unwieldy. The codes became hard to follow. It favored big business. Within a year, Roosevelt wanted to get out of it. And the Supreme Court would find it unconstitutional two years later. So everyone got that's why I'm unconstitutional there. Now, it it's arguable whether or not the you know, would have been unconstitutional 20 years from now. You know, it doesn't even matter. But Roosevelt was mad at the court, but actually glad it was gone because he became more interested in not helping big business. So these are all efforts of the first New Deal. Just trying everything. What did he call that? By trying everything and not fascist, not communist. What was that middle he called it? Yeah, that was liberal. Liberal. And that's where the, taking that term in economic rights, not just civil rights. Now, let's go through a couple more of the programs of the First New Deal. The AAA, uh, the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And the idea of the AAA was to stabilize farm prices. What's the problem? Overproduction. Overproduction. So pay farmers not to grow. Now, we're not going to go into all the details of how the AAA worked. And it did help stabilize the situation. These are the number dropping dramatically of farm foreclosures because of the AAA. Now, you might be wondering with valid 
justification. Wait a minute, you're in a depression and people are starving and you're paying farmers not to grow. There were issues, but this too would be found unconstitutional. I don't think I typed that in. Yeah, found unconstitutional. I did type that in. Infuriating Roosevelt. There's going to be, and I know you're excited, a second AAA. Which would be farm policy from back, what, 38 till 73. 19. Another one, the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. A massive program of hydroelectric dams, controlling floods, bringing irrigation and job through much of the South. And the South was really being left behind by the second industrial revolution. And this, this along with other programs, would bring electricity to much of rural America. There's another program called the REA, for example, that would help bring electricity to, to rural Montana. So the New Deal was this huge program. I'm not giving you all the programs, but they built dams throughout this entire region. And because of the hydroelectric power, that would be the first area where they would um, begin to separate uranium-235 and uranium-238, making the atomic bomb against electricity. It is still a massive program. This was one of Roosevelt's most prized uh, programs. And if you go to the FDR Memorial in Washington, D.C., there is kind of a symbol of a dam showing his, his uh, love of the, hydro or the hydroelectric power. Moving on, public, other public works to create jobs and what we would today call infrastructure. They did not use the word infrastructure. That was a very rarely used word. Now people use it all the time. And so, so roads, dams, airports. So the first Helena Airport was started under the PWA, which was the Public Works Administration. The CWA, Civil Works Administration, just know the initials, and the CCC fit in there too. We saw that yesterday. And it would be started, for example, that's Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia. And so many of the dams on the Columbia, a bunch of dams in Montana, the PWA would start for Peck, and then finish with the WPA, alphabet soup, I know. And CWA did a lot of jobs like in, within towns of, of rehabilitating or cleaning up parks, playgrounds for children, children's, children building schools, etc. They weren't huge programs, but they did to provide jobs. Next. I'm not kidding, I'm gonna go next. This month. Glass-Steagall Act. This was one of the most important laws in American history, the Glass-Steagall Act. And by the way, all, I didn't put down all the public works programs, but I trust me, Glass-Steagall will be on the test. <coughs> TBA will be on the test. <laughs> They're big deals. You don't need to know every detail about it, but we got to know Glass-Steagall. And this one, banking regulation. The most important regulation was separating investment. This is some from the commercial banks. Commercial banks, those are the banks where you have your savings account, where you might go get a car loan. House law. Investment banks are the Wall Street banks, the banks that deal with speculation and corporations. What was happening were banks were taking their deposits from the commercial side and loaning them out, loaning them out to speculate or even speculating themselves. And so for 66 years, these banks are going to be separated and therefore avoid the panics. This and other regulations would avoid panics, but there are going to be no financial panics. None. That led to debt deflation and the problems that we would see in the Great Depression of panic in 1993, et cetera, from 1933 until 2008. It's kind of amazing. It worked so well. And the other thing was, what about all those people who lost their deposits? Glass-Steagall created the FDIC. So here's on the, this is inside the foyer of the FDIC. And this would bring stability to the banking system for, six, oh, oh, for 70 years. And so what happens is the FDIC, it, would, it ensures deposits. And so if you have a bank deposit in a, in a bank that is under FDIC, if the bank collapses, the FDIC will pay. 
And so banks will, will pay into the insurance, how insurance works. They pay into it, and then if the bank collapses, they get the money. Now there's a limit. What is it now, $300,000? Deposits under $300,000 are protected. <coughs> so very big deposits aren't, but the idea being the vast majority, about 98% of all deposits are protected by the FDIC. And banks agree to go in the FDIC, and by agreeing it, that means FDIC regulators go in and they check the books of a bank, and they go see if they have reserves. And the FDIC can take over the bank and literally take it over and sell it to somebody else. That is the authority the FDIC has to keep, because the banking system is so crucial for the entire nation's economy. So that just happened to a big bank in New York that just about collapsed. The FDIC took it over because they, well, essentially, they violated the law by not having uh, proper reserves. And so this is a pretty startling graph. I showed you one like this before. Here are all the bank failures during the 30, up to 32, FDIC. Okay, they got rid of FDIC protection for this thing called savings and loans, and they crushed themselves. And then there were hardly any banks that collapsed during the, the Great Depression, the Great Recession that you lived through. The FDIC, without a doubt, saved the world from financial destruction when you were just a little kid. I know what you're saying. Oh, it would have been fun to grow up in a thing where everyone lived in cargo boxes and widely in the streets. But you missed out. Yeah, the FDIC, without a doubt, saved because it kept it kept um, bank panics from happening. But in 1999, Congress repealed much of Glass Steagall, especially at this point. So this was part of the conservative anti-regulation wave. And so it was basically pushed by most Republicans and about half the Democrats, including the conservative Democratic president at that time, Bill Clinton, who was economically very conservative. And they repealed it. And almost immediately the banks started becoming investment in commercial banks. And it's you got to admit, it's kind of impressive that it took less than a decade for them to have their first bank panic. You got to give them something, some little round of applause, right? You're not going to do it, are you? It's actually shocking how fast it happened. And some, and they basically the same regulation still exists. And so there's just fewer banks. Next, securities and exchange. That was 34, but it's considered part of the first new deal. And that regulated the stock markets and also demanded companies to tell the truth about their revenues. They could not lie about the revenues or the size of their company. You could imagine the companies with growing revenues, their stock would be in value, would be in demand. Now, yes, of course, they still lie about it, and they create shell companies that get rid of their losses and things like that. It also banned insider trading, so using inside information either be um, either directly involved in the business that might be coming up with a different change or. A report that might raise or lower the revenue, they could buy or sell stocks, take advantage of it. But insider trading happens all the time, too. I should add, does anyone know the most famous person who was arrested in spent time in federal prison for insider trading? Have you ever seen Martha Stewart? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was guilty as all get out for insider trading. <laughs> and now she's back on the Food Network and every place else. Oh. Now, once again, it's like any regulatory body. If the president is very pro-regulation, the SEC is pretty strict, or they at least have look into that. If the president is anti-regulation, the SEC would do almost nothing. And this also fits you. All these programs are conservative economics are opposed to this. Next, the end of the gold standard. This was the thing that Hoover was trying to get Roosevelt to agree to before his inauguration. And so early 33, the U.S. got off the gold center, and that allowed the Federal Reserve to inflate currency. They no longer had to have it tied to the amount of golden reserves or the value of gold. And so it allowed to pump money in to inflate these and create, create uh, inflation. So remember, the problem is debt deflation. So that allowed them to pump money out there in the economy. 
And it doesn't work perfectly, but it immediately led to improving economies so they could pump up the money supply. So money that is not backed by some artificial element out of the control of the government, like gold or your grain storage or the euro, that is called fiat currency. The United States has fiat currency today. And it's much more stable than the gold standard. The gold standard is really unstable because the, the value of gold is so unstable. But this is a graph showing this, the growth in the GDP of various powers and when it has the color when it comes to when they got off the gold standard. And every country that got off the gold standard be that economic growth. Japan got off of the earliest and took the most advantage of it. Britain, Germany, the United States, France, as a measure of national pride, they refused to go out the gold standard. And their economic growth was so low in the 30s that would really hurt them in World War II. They would be economically behind Germany. So, oh, I should add, so after World War II, the United States kind of quasi went back on the gold standard and called the Bretton Woods Agreement. And then in 1971, the US totally went off. So your entire life, the United States has been off the gold standard. Yeah, and we'll get back to the Bretton Woods. There was an agreement in 1944 during the war. And most countries, significant numbers are kind of fiat, but there's a lot that are like Europe. It's on artificial, and the country's on something called the Euro. So it, it kind of has the same effect as the gold standard. Okay. Also, intensely antitrust, anti-monopoly. Despite what the NRA did, NRA did, Roosevelt, no president up to Roosevelt would enforce antitrust viol or antitrust and anti-monopoly policy more than Roosevelt. So here's a cartoon of Roosevelt. And who's that? Now, Teddy Roosevelt was nicknamed the trust buster. Now Roosevelt was much more against monopolies than Roosevelt. His cousin ever was. So they enforced the Sherman Antitrust Act and they enforced the FTA, FTC. And so they made sure that no company would get too big to dominate a market. They consider 60% of the market is basically control. 30% is too much control. And that would be the norm up until the late 1970s. And it was reversed in 78. Uh, there was inflation. There was worry about prices being too high, and that's when the Congress started deregulating, not enforcing it, and allowing for bigger companies. Started in the airline industry, they deregulated, thinking that would improve service and price. It did for about ten years, and now we're at where we're at today. And they did it with trucking, they did it with everything, and that president was a conservative Democrat by the name of Jimmy Carter. And then that would help usher in the major conservative revolution with Ronald Reagan, a Republican. So, the FHA, another big one. The Federal Housing Administration, to encourage home ownership, would provide first-time homeowners with mortgage insurance. So basically, insurance on your mortgage if you can't pay back your loan to the bank. This would allow for more people than ever before to own homes. And the number of homes, private ownership would go up from 40 to 65 percent from the years of the New Deal up until 2005. It's it's floating at about 67, 68 percent right now. It went way down, and now it's kind of going back up. I think part of the reason is because home values are so expensive. People are desperately trying to hold on to a home right now. I don't know if you know this, but houses are really expensive nationwide. Nationwide, they basically quit making houses after 2007. I know you see construction, but they have not kept up with demand at all nationwide. And so you could get, you could own a home. And this is gonna allow more people than ever before to own a home. Put this down. This would be the beginning of a kind of a new American dream to own your own home. And that is the biggest source of wealth for most families today, to own their home. It's also huge tax breaks. The United States taxpayers, so if you pay taxes, you subsidize homeownership. So for example, if 
you buy a home, the mortgage you pay, interest, is tax deductible. So you pay less taxes than people who don't own a home or already paid off their home. Therefore, it's welfare for homeowners. Huge government program to give money to homeowners. And property taxes are tax deductible. So this is a big government program to give money to homeowners. It's one of the biggest programs. Yeah. So for example, when I had a mortgage, I got the tax break. And that was nice. And now that I don't have a mortgage, I notice it. Next, part of this though, something they did, and this wasn't Roosevelt's personal policy, but it fit in with the racism of the time. It's called redlining. And redlining would basically set up areas where they would mark off in cities. This is Philadelphia. And areas in red, they wouldn't give mortgage insurance. If they don't give mortgage insurance, that means no one, it's very difficult to buy a home there. If it's very difficult to buy a home, that means housing prices drop, and that means home values drop. That means that people who live there, by definition, are going to have significantly less wealth. And basically, how did they divvy this up? By what? The favored whites. It was by color of skin. It was by color of skin. And this would be government practice, even though technically it violated the law until 1968. And boy, you can tell the difference. It's like a line you cross in big cities where they do red line. Where you go from the area that were blue or yellow, where they provided mortgage insurance, to where it was red, you go to an area where you can just tell the houses are not as well maintained because they just don't have as much wealth. I mean, it's noticeable. And there is a legacy, therefore, by color of skin. So, the results of the first New Deal. It gave confidence. The economy did grow, as you can see by this GDP number. But it was not big enough. And that's why you have the cartoon of Roosevelt with a deck of cards and he drops to play another card. It got the economy going, but the unemployment was still too high. Unemployment was way too high. So this chart, which did not transcribe to the documents, that's why I didn't use it. I just gave, kept giving me a black screen. I couldn't figure out why. And I, I had to get it to the print shop. So, so. Here's the official unemployment numbers. And they're clearly going down, but it was still technically at 25%. But if you count the PWA, the CWA, the CCC, the TBA, the actual real unemployment rate was closer to 15%. But they count, they didn't count those people as unemployed for reasons that it goes back to the early 1920s, and it's not clear why. Today we would count them as employed. So it was still too high. Now, we got to introduce something. And I don't, I'm not alone when I say this is not very good history, but we got to get the three R's because this might be on the AP exam. This is not very good economics, not very good history, but they sometimes refer to this. So I got to tell you what they are. And I don't, and I dislike it so much, I didn't even bother to type it in. I used somebody else's chart because of my annoyance that I have to tell you this. This is called relief, recovery, and reform. So relief. Just direct relief to people who are suffering because of the depression, like Farrah. Now, I added Farrah because I didn't like their, their example. Recover, get the economy going again, like the WPA, the big works programs. And reform, to keep it from happening again, so like the FDIC or the SEC, et cetera, the Glass-Steagall. Everyone got that? You, the three R's, relief, recovery, reform. Now, why this is not very good economics and not very good history is because you can't really divide the laws like that. Sure, laws like FARA might have been direct relief, but also have to recover it. The WPA was all three. It provided direct relief by jobs, with jobs. It got the economy going again. And by building the infrastructure, made sure it would not happen again. So it's too complex for this. But I have to introduce it. Because if it is on the AP exam, I want to make sure that we're all found. Now, that, of course, that means there won't be any questions on the New Deal at all on the AP exam. 
We've gone through many years where they don't even have the Great Depression. Or World War II, or the 20s, or the 50s. Yeah, nothing big happened. Or the 1930s, you know, that changed everything. Or World War I, or World War II. Really, you know, but then last year they had more. That's the point. Is it more like they feel it's too easy? I think the part is they think people have studied enough. They've already studied it, so we'll give you something you haven't studied, which makes no sense at all. That's a silly way to do it. But then again, they will. They might have, and we just got to be ready. There's my little flash of annoyance. But then again, I got to be honest with you. I don't have to take the test. I'm OK. I'm cool. With it. I'm sorry about that. That's the problem with standardized tests, as you will find out next week. Right? You get what you get, right? I mean, it's just, you get what you get, and you got to do the best you can. I wish I had better advice. So moving on. Enemies of FDR were everywhere. On the conservative, or more to your right, they were furious at him. This violated their principal economic philosophy of trickle-down economics and social Darwinism by giving aid to people who are just going to drink it away, or they, they would say, use it on drugs. But, and so it totally violates this. But another big one, they hated his tax increases. Progressive income taxes are one of the most important way to funnel money to working people by raising taxes on the top. It is the most effective way. And they hated it. Another thing was they hated the fact because New Deal programs did not discriminate based upon race. Oh, they did not get rid of Jim Crow. But for example, the WPA, they could not look at color of skin when they hired people. I just told you, the FHA did discriminate really bad. But for jobs, no. And that was unprecedented since Reconstruction. And so he was a communist. Socialist experiment. He's a red. He's a Bolshevik. And he's a traitor to his class. And so here, acting like he's a king. And this is and getting rid of the Constitution. I should add, these arguments would be similar kind of drawings we used against Andrew Jackson. When Andrew Jackson said he's going to do something about the big corporations and the bank and help for the common man. Now, once again, every president is, every person outside of his complex. So Jackson also did other things. But moving on. So this would be, I didn't put it down, but the spring, I'm sorry, the fall of 33. It's called the Wall Street Pooch, or the Conservative Coup. An effort by some of the richest Americans under the blanket organization of this group called the American Liberty League, which was started to stop the Bolsheviks during World War I. They tried to overthrow the government and replace it with a new government. Some of the leaders were members of the DuPont family. Anybody know what the DuPonts make? Like plastic wrap. Huh? Is it plastic wrap? They did make plastic wrap, they make paint, they everything from chemical. Chemicals. And JP Morgan Jr. financing. Uh, they're members of the Bush family involved, who's George W. Bush was a descendant of them, he was president when you guys were born, right? And they tried to overthrow the government. And their plan was so that is Morgan and one of the DuPonts the American Liberty League, and replace it with, and they were very open in their conversations. They admired fascism. Specifically, they wanted a government like their new hero, Benito Mussolini, who had taken power in Germany, uh, I'm sorry, in Italy, kind of, nine years earlier. And there is Mussolini, what Mussolini did organized this right-wing, ultra-nationalistic group called fascism, which also destroyed labor unions and was very pro-corporation, so they loved them, and rapidly anti-communism. The organizing principle of fascism is anti-communism. 
Hitler's organizing principle was anti-communist. But he used World War I veterans and used their anger over the war. In fact, they dressed them all in black uniforms called the black shirts. And they were paid for by wealthy Italian uh, <coughs> industrialists. Yeah, question. Yeah. And you kind of already know what happened here. They marched on Rome in 24 and forced, and the, the king panicked and allowed Mussolini to take off over the government. Listen, listen carefully. Veterans of World War One marched on the capital and they got a fascist government. And something like that happened about a year before Roosevelt took office. Does anybody remember the Bonus Army? And they thought they could reorganize the Bonus Army and pick the most decorated soldier in American history before World War II, Smedley Butler. Those of you who watched The Road to Rock Bottom, he spoke to the Bonus Army to lead them. They would march on Washington, D.C. and force Roosevelt to turn over pre the presidents. He would remain as president but all the power would go to this new department called the Department of the Homeland. And they would operate as a dictator. I can remember in 2002 when, they, when this, this Rube Goldberg of a strategy to combine all these groups into one thing called Department of Homeland Security, which you've all heard of, of 2002. And I, I cringed. That really, God, you kidding me. Could you morons pick a, a better name? And the answer was, we don't know history. They didn't, but Smedley Butler heard out the DuPonts. He met with DuPonts, few other people, met with them, nodded, and immediately went to Roosevelt and told him what happened. Smedley Butler hated their guts. Smedley Butler wrote a book about him being in big stick diplomacy after he was in Nicaragua and, and Haiti, where he said he was a gangster for Wall Street. He was nothing but a pirate. And he told on it. But Washington, or I'm sorry, I, I, I should add, all these people fled the country. They got on steamships and left as quick as they could. Roosevelt decided that this might lead to a communist revolution if he arrested some of the leading industrialists in the United States for treason. So he just basically made it clear, I know what happened. This is Smedley Butler at the newsreel footage where he told about what happened. So they broadcast this in movie theaters in early 1934. Looking back, I kind of think they should have, uh, let me rephrase that. I believe they should have arrested those people. Treason is not something you should let go lightly. And it seems like we have been too many times. Secondly, isn't Smedley a great man? Isn't Smedley? So, even though conservative opposition remained throughout the New Deal, Profits for companies actually skyrocketed. Look at the profits go up. And then World War II hit profits, really gone, went up. And so, yes, they still supported Republican opposition. They're certainly not going to support Democrats now. Before they kind of, kind of split the difference. But it wasn't, there were no more major coup efforts. But yes, there was a major and organized effort to overthrow the economy. Here is a cartoon mocking the um, the very wealthy attack, who attacked Roosevelt, saying, boo-hoo, the New Deal is, re is ruining the country. And here are newspaper headlines showing all the record revenues. Yeah. The New Deal increased profits. Yeah, for company. That's not connected to the Well, it, New Deal increased profits. So many of the people who would have been behind the coup became less anxious to have a coup. Next. But the most famous opposition on the right was Father Kopp, who came out at first for the New Deal. He was known as the radio priest. So there were a lot of, especially evangelical, and that new term fundamentalist, radio preachers at this time. But Father Kopp, by 1931, had an immense following. And his big thing were that the banks were destroying us. And also, he was rapidly anti-communist. But as the years went by, he turned into a huge attacker of Roosevelt, saying he's a communist and saying that 
Not only is Roosevelt not doing anything, doing anything about the banks, he is secretly being controlled by a cabal of Jews. He was intensely anti-Semitic. And by 1940, he had a following of millions. Here he is at the old um, Tiger Stadium in Detroit, where he, he gave, he would, he did this a number of years, fill a baseball stadium to listen to him give his radio broadcasts. And this is a time I just was kind of unheard of. So we brought us on the radio to be on the PA speakers. There's two different ones right there. And for example, in the newsletter he sent out saying that Roosevelt was literally in the pocket of Jews, this is a picture from it. And it's a horrible caricature of, of that this Jewish banker with Roosevelt in his pocket. He called him Rosenfeld. So it'd be similar to a more Jewish surname. And it showed how anti-Semitic that time was. Now his popularity would drop, especially after Germany declared war on the United States in 1941. But it showed the opposition. This was much more, not the top-down wealthy doing it. This is more, at least, he's funded by very wealthy, but organizing kind of regular folk. There were a lot of opposition from the left, too. For example, communists despised Roosevelt. He saved capitalism. They hated him. They were fearful. He was saving capitalism. Remember, to, a so to, a to most communists and a lot of socialists, they think that capitalism is destroying the country. Here is the Communist Party was pretty big in 33. <laughs> And there are a lot of people. Oh, and the other thing was, Roosevelt did nothing about Jim Crow laws. Here is the communist uh, ticket, uh, 1936. And, his, and Foster was running for president and his running mate, Ford, was the first African-American on a ticket that got over to the vote. Also, no women's rights. And so there were a number of people called fellow travelers who, especially the kind of like educated elite, a lot of the media, Hollywood uh, personalities, they toyed with socialism, went to meetings and thought maybe that was the answer. They bought the Stalinist propaganda that the Soviet Union was, was weathering the, the, the Great Depression and booming. They didn't know about the purges and the famine. But you might say, okay, what about this? After World War II, the second rare Red Scare would come out. And it would get a name after a certain relatively unknown drunken senator from Wisconsin. Anybody know that senator? Have you heard of McCarthy? McCarthyism. They would bring all this back. I heard you went to a meeting. You're a communist. And people's lives would be ruined because of this. But FDR used this quite effectively. What FDR did was this. He told more conservative Democrats, if we don't pass some kind of reform, they're coming. He also did the same with the other one. He went to more people who wanted more programs. If we don't pass a more moderate program like I want, here come the fascists. And so we use that. We don't have much of a left here now, but there was much more then. So for example, Dr. Francis Townsend offered this idea of a massive, at the time, bigger than median wage, a pension for every retired person of $2,000 a year. Townsend clubs popped up to push the Townsend plan. Soon, thousands of people are pushing for this whole day pension. Yesterday in class, I told you about how scary retirement was for people. And this would give Roosevelt, he could use this to say, I'm being pushed to not near as big as the Townsend plan, but Social Security. By the way, this is how you negotiate. Don't negotiate for what exactly you want. Negotiate for much higher, and then you can negotiate down. Now, that doesn't always work. 
But don't start with what you want because you have no room to negotiate. And if you do negotiate, you lose. Huey Long was another example of opposition from the, from the left. He was known as the Kingfish. And the Kingfish ran the state of Louisiana. And yeah, he got rich off of it too. He was governor and senator from there. And he started this idea of share our wealth. He came up with a plan. In fact, the clubs, their slogan was every man a king. And they would give everybody a guaranteed income. I didn't put a hyphen there. A guaranteed income of $2,000 a year. Uh, there should be a hyphen. There. And then a hyphen or a, a backslash. And then they would cap all income at $1 million. So basically saying all income over $1 million will be taxed at 100%. So let's say you make $2 million a year. That, that million you make over $1 million a year will be all taxed 100%. Capping income. And the money would be used for everyone to get a homestead. The homestead, that was money. They called it a homestead. And you can imagine how popular this was. He said, I'm going to get those people. Roosevelt claimed he was going to attack those money changers. I'm going to do it. And he even talked about running for president to push Roosevelt even further as a third party candidate. And it's one of the great what ifs in history. And he was charming and funny, ruthless. If he would have ran as a third party candidate, who would he have stolen votes from? Yeah, from the Democrats. He would have assured a Republican would be elected. Oh, you have a question? Everyone would get $2,000 a year. And then there should be a back. So I, I forgot to put a slash there. So everyone would get $2,000 a year and then cap income of $1 million. Oh, yeah, everything would be taxed after a million dollars. But every single person, regardless of their income, would be two thousand dollars a year, guaranteed. Just citizen of the United States. So guaranteed yearly income. But he was assassinated. Nineteen thirty-five. I was really struggling. That's supposed to be Doctor Carl Bibby. He was a son-in-law to a judge that didn't get promoted in Louisiana. It was just pure Louisiana politics. Opened up a revolver into his back and murdered Huey Long. It's one of the great what-ifs in history. He probably wouldn't have been elected president, but it would split the Democrats. We might have President Alf Landon. Now, I'm not saying I would have wanted Alf Landon as president, but it would have been cool to have a president named Alf. I should add, that is the exceedingly ugly capital that Huey Long built in Baton Rouge. He was killed at the Massey Store right here. That's a statue. That's B.B. Hardy. Okay, so I have good news for all of you. Since I told stories, I think I finished, the test will be on Thursday. I think I told you at the beginning of the I wanted to make sure I told yeah. you again. Well, okay. so, yeah, for your covering the I'll finish the second of the other Yeah, I can tell you were you were like whatever I can tell something on top of that. Wait, we make them at the end. Oh, yeah. He said the day of the last day of the last day of the last day of the Since I'm gone for Monday, next week, just since you're covering up whole another day of content. Yeah, just remind me. No, you're just because you're not happy. Just remind me. Yeah. Put your name on it. 
<laughs> Come here, I'll give you a pen. After all we've been through. No. Why are we late, by the way? Um, I just was confused and thought it was here today because I thought the test was today and it was just all the time. I did the same thing. I missed the test. I was like, I was like, oh, we got a shot for film. There are some very weird starting points. Thanks, Partridge.